effort as we see uh, the culmination of, of what's going on and uh, Lord, you're pouring out of your judgments, uh, Lord, to uh, bring back uh, the beauty of creation. And God, as you just guide us and direct us, help us to see you through every situation. In your name we pray. Amen. I did. Kay reminded me. I got it this time. Last week I forgot to hit record until the very end. So, hey, first time for everything. So, oh, good. So, all right. Um, so we as we kind of wrapping up, you know, we're all the judgments have been poured out. Um, I think that as we take a look at, uh, we looked at seventeen, eighteen, and nineteen. Um, I think these verses, these chapters, uh, really kind of are that kind of that wrapping up of all that's going on. Um, this chapter is all about the fall of the Antichrist. And so uh, we understand that I think chapter going back, chapter 17 is right there in the middle of the tribulation. Um, chapter 18 kind of is between the fall of the church and the fall of the Antichrist. Um, and then some believe that chapter 19 is really that right there at the judgments when the, the final of the Bold judgments are being poured out. You know, we've seen that the fall of the, the church there and then the fall of the government. And as we look today, we're going to see the fall of the Antichrist. And so it's important for us to understand that this verse is really, as uh, J. Vernon McGee said, is a somber song that is really going to tell us how everything is going to fall into place. And so kind of once again, I'm just going to kind of read the verses as we go through uh, because I want to spend some time on them. And then chapter 20 next week is ultimately that final battle, uh, that final wrap-up before we see the new heaven and the new earth that have come into play. Um, and we see that uh, significance. So verse 1 says this, after these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. John's attention is brought to this hallelujah or alleluia, some versions say that the martyred have finally been vindicated. We're at the point they have the righteousness of what's happened to them has come to a conclusion. And it's interesting that really through all of this, what we see is really a song of praise. You think, how can you sing praise in the middle of what's going on? But you got to remember, this is a praise about God bringing back what was ultimately always supposed to be there. So even in the midst of destruction, there's got to be praise. He goes on in verse 2, he says this, Because of his judgment are true and righteous, for he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. And a second time they said, Hallelujah! Her smoke rises up forever and ever. See, in verse 2 and 3, what we see is a great fall of the of the of the antichrist the harlot and then in verse 4 what we see is these elders and the creatures joining in everybody is singing they fell down and worship verse 4 the living creatures around the throne saying amen hallelujah there is a praise it's all about singing creation 
It's interesting to note, um, we could go all the way back to the beginning of Revelation about the 24 elders and the four living creatures and how they and who they are. And so just as a reminder, one creature has the face of man. We are the highest of all creation. It gets me sometimes when people will go, well, you know, animals and man are really equal with each other. No. According to Scripture, we are given dominion over, create, over creatures. I think the, the other thing is that we have the ability to choose between right and wrong. And I use this example a lot with students. I say, you know, the lion out in the desert or out in the Serengeti doesn't look at the weak zebra and go, I wonder if I should eat that or not. If the lion's hungry, it's going to eat something. We are the highest order of creation. We have the ability to know between what's right and wrong. God has given us that ability. We're also reminded that one is an eagle. Of all the living creatures, the flying creatures, the eagle is the greatest. We were someplace with the kids one time. I forget where we were at. And they were talking about uh, eagle's nests. The eagle's nests sometimes are so big that a, an adult person can lay down across an eagle's nest. That they are the greatest of all flying creatures. The face of a lion. You no, know, the lion, king of the jungle. All right. They are the, the, supposed to be the pinnacle of all wild animals. And then the calf is the greatest of all domesticated animals. I guess that we should, you know, it used to be dog is a man's best friend. Maybe it really should be a cow is a man's best friend. I, I don't know. But the, the four living creatures are represented by the different aspects there. And we know that the 24 elders, 12 of them are the tribes of Israel. And the other 12 represent the apostles. And it's important for us really to understand, and I don't know if when we went back. So it's really representative of the, the 12 tribes is the Old Testament. The 12 apostles is the New Testament. Kind of joining those two things together is how those are represented. It's, it's you know, we don't focus a lot on symbolism because I think you, you still get so bogged down. But to really kind of see the overall how everything has come together. Verse 5 says this. And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, who fear him, the small and the great. Now there's a lot of question about this says, I heard a voice. Uh, John Walford said it's probably an angel. Okay. But let me make sure we understand who's here. Okay. The lamb is here. That is Jesus. And the bride is there. That's the church. So I think it probably could be an angel. Because it says there, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made himself ready. That's Jesus in the church. But it probably is a, a, an angel speaking to help us to understand what is going on. Because we've seen a lot of angels throughout this whole time. 
You know, we talk about the, the marriage supper. The marriage supper is about the church coming together with Jesus. We understand that the marriage supper is all of us. And that we are there together for who God has called us to be. We are joining with that final place and who we're going to be with. We know that the bride is spoken of. He says, it is given to her to clothe herself in white or fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is righteous acts of the saints. Of the obedience that we have been called to, we are called to be that in who Christ wants us to be. The bride has readied herself. The church has readied itself. And Jesus has made that clean because his shedding of his blood. Right? We've seen from scripture where we're made clean white as snow. As the song says. You know, the Bible tells us, um, the reference is gone from my mind right now, but our works are as filthy rags. And I... I... <laughs> I pick with the kids a lot. Sometimes we'll be talking about something, and I'll say, you know, when I was living in the orphanage, I, by the way, I never lived in an orphanage, but I tell my kids that. I told them one time that the story of Annie was based off of my life. We were someplace, I was telling them, I was, I was talking about I had this hard knock life, you know. So you get the picture. Remember the original Annie movie? You know, the original one. You know, they had those rags on. And that's kind of, you know, I kind of think about that when I think about our, our we were made as filthy rags. But when you went from that spot to a home in heaven, we were made white as clean. clean we were made clean, and our clothes became clean. So you go from Annie, from living in the, the rags to living with Daddy Warbucks, you know, and having all these things. But yes, I, I know it's probably wrong for me to lie to my kids, but sometimes it's just so fun, okay? Like when they were little, I convinced them that I was allergic to green vegetables, the reason I didn't have to eat them, so. Hal, don't shake your head at me. You, 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 know, you know you used to do that, too. Yeah. <laughs> Lying to your kid. Lying. Yeah, see? I'm in, good, I'm in good company. But we, you know, we're made clean. We were filthy, dirty. I mean, the only other example I could give is you think about the pig pen character off of Snoopy, right? You know, walks around with a dust cloud. And then all of a sudden we're made clean. And we're presented to Christ as the bride. And it's amazing kind of understanding because of our obedience, not who we are, but our obedience to come to him. That's the difference. Verse 9. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper. Now I want us to understand, there is a distinction between the bride and those who attend the marriage supper. Okay? So remember, we are part of the church. But we should understand that it's because we've been invited to be a part of that by Jesus' calling. Now I want us to be clear. The Bible is clear. Everyone gets invited. But not everybody showed up. Does that make sense? 
Jesus says he wishes all should come to repentance, that none should perish. Some people have chosen to respond to that invitation to be at the marriage supper, those who are saved. Everybody's been invited, but everybody doesn't respond to that invitation. You know, sometimes you, you think about if you've been at revivals, and maybe a, a, a pastor's preaching, he says, you know, I, I feel like there's one more that needs to come. Because some people don't want to come to the invitation. Some people don't want to respond. So we understand that we've been invited, and because we've been invited, we have said yes to that invitation. But there are still people who have said no to the invitation. There's a difference. Some people will respond it. They're there. If you're saved, you've, 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 been, you've accepted that invitation. If somebody's not saved, they've been invited. The invitation's sitting there. And that invitation is as good until they're no longer living. Because at that moment, you can no longer be invited. I think an example is like the rich man and Lazarus. Right? Lazarus responded to the invitation. He, is, he was invited. He responded. He's sitting at the marriage supper. The rich man, what does he try to do after he dies? Tries to go back and get reinvited. Tries to pass along that invitation to somebody else. Right? Oh, if you'll just send them back, I know they'll show up. No, they've got other people trying to tell them. So I want us to understand we're there. And then notice in verse 10, what do they do? They fell at the feet and worship. What are we going to be doing in heaven? Worshiping. 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 Verse 11. And I saw the heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in his righteousness he judges and wages war. There is a great distinction between this horse and the horse of chapter 6. Then I saw the lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice of thunder, Come, and I looked, behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now we know who that is, right? It's the devil. It's the Antichrist. Here. He who sat on it is called faithful and true. And just so we're clear, okay, if you look at the word he, faithful, and true, they're all capitalized. If I remember from English, that means that's a person. That is Jesus. This is Jesus coming, ready to give us an understanding. Faithful and true, contrast it with the one who's going to conquer. Jesus does not have to conquer because he already is the one who's over everything. Verse 12. His eyes are a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. Eyes are a flame of fire. That is his judgment. He can pierce into the soul of judgment. On his head are many diadems. There's a difference between a crown in Scripture and a diadem. A crown is usually given to somebody. A diadem 
is, is he has the authority. You know, with the, with the queen's passing, I don't know how many of you have ever seen the show or not. The Crown on Netflix. I hate to say it. I totally love that show. I love that show. You know, they talk about there's a scene where her dad is putting on the crown. They're talking about the weight of having, not the physical weight, not only the physical weight, but the weight of on the body of being the ruler. And now that's been passed on. That is a crown that is given to somebody. Now to, to Charles, right? This, a diadem is something that that person already has. It is not to be given to somebody else. Jesus can't pass on, right? I mean, that was his prayer in the garden, right? Jesus, or God, Father, let this cup pass from me. The angels come along. <laughs> Nevertheless, not your will but mine. It's already there. His authority. He has a name. Nobody knows. Okay? What that name is. Okay? It is his glory. It is his def- we, beyond our understanding. I know sometimes we joke. We say, when we get to heaven, I'm going to ask God this question. I, there's still things that are beyond our understanding. Because we're not God. right? And, and we'll never understand. His clothed, uh, verse 13, and is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That is his redemption. His blood was shed for us. It is the redemption of who he is. And his name is called the Word of God symbolized in the eternal nature. And that is a, a reference to John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus, and the Word, Jesus, was with God, and the Word, Jesus, was God. Uh, verse 14. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and, his, and on his thigh, uh, he has a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. So the sword, uh, it's actually where we get the word javelin from. Okay. Um, you, know, the, you know, take a javelin, a spear, you can throw it a long distance. I mean, I've seen those guys throw the javelin in the Olympics. I mean, they take that thing and it just flies through the air. But I also think about a sword because it says that sword is to strike down. You know, elsewhere in Scripture, it's talking about the, the sword of God cuts to the marrow. I mean, it's a sword that can cut through to the innermost parts of the bone. The iron absolute control it is unyielding it is uncompromising he treads the wine press of fierce wrath of god the day of grace and mercy have passed and is complete judgment of the earth thank goodness we still have the mercy and grace right now but that's coming to an end And as the good song says, soon and very soon. And his robe and on his thigh is written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Here here at the last has come the one who has ruled eternity. He is unyielding. He is uncompromising. 
Somebody wrote, there is nothing more inflexible than divine judgment where grace has been spurred. You know, I think some people have a hard time with that. Oh, God should just be so, you know, compromising. I was talking to somebody the other day. They were talking about their pastor says, you know, oh, you can... You can love people, you can love whoever you want, you can be who you want to be. That's, that's, that God does not compromise. His word is unshakable, and it, it never bends. And we need to understand that he is the king of kings, he's the lord of lords, and his judgment rings true. He says down in verse 17, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of uh, commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and all those who sit on them and the flesh of all men both free men and slaves, small and great. You can cross out the word birds and put buzzards. That's what they are. I mean, I hate to say it, but we have that very picture here at this church. (laughs) If you come at certain times, those buzzards, those vultures are on the roof. And the one that gets me is the one that sits on the top of the cross, and he spreads his wings out, and he looks like this. I mean, it's just, they're, they're huge. Our granddaughters think they're eagles. Yeah. They're not eagles. No, they say, I took Caleb one time on the worst field trip ever. We went to the, the Renaissance Fair. Absolute worst field trip ever. So we went to this bird, they did this like this bird show. I did not realize that buzzards or vultures have no feathers from their neck up because they, they only eat dead animals that could carry diseases that they don't have feathers on their head so they don't, those diseases will not be a part of their feathers and stuff. The Renaissance Festival. Worst field trip ever in the history of the world. Okay. Could have been having sixth grade boys walk around seeing the girls dressed in those outfits. That may have been it, but still worst field trip ever. Worse than being in the orphanage. Um, but so if you see them, they have no feathers because they only eat the things that are dead. And so basically the picture is here of all the people who have died or are going to, those buzzers are going to clean it up. That's what, they're, that's what they do. They clean up the animals that are dead. And it, so we see it. Now they're scary. And it's the ones around here, they're pretty big. Um, scares Kathy half to death when she comes in in the morning and those buzzers are up there. I drive through and I honk the horn, you know, to try to get rid of them, but they don't listen. Yes, Alfred Hitchcock, there's a for everybody. Yeah, when I tell people about our church, it's on Shady Lane. Yeah. <laughs> and we have buzzers. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. But I will say, we're not the only church I've seen them hanging out at, okay? So, but th- that's what they're going to do. They're going to, they're, it, buzzards only circle when there's death. Now, you see eagles and hawks and other birds of play, they're, they're circling around, but they see something that's alive. They see a rabbit. They see something. But when the buzzards are circling, there's something dead. That's, that's, they don't eat the rabbits going across this field here. They're, they only eat the dead things. Okay? So there's a difference there. Verse 19. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against 
Jesus who sat on the horse and against Jesus' army. This is the battle of Armageddon that's getting ready to happen. Verse 20. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which came out of the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. That's a great picture. But, you know, we talk about the battle of Armageddon. We'll talk a little bit more about this next week. But if you if you really understand if we if we if we read those verses literally as they are written, right? How did the rest of the people die? Was there was there was there this huge battle like we think of like when you think of battles like people on either side like going back and forth? Verse 21, the rest were killed by what? The sword. One strike. And I never really thought about that. I mean, it's one of those things, I've read this a lot, but it's finally one of those times going, that wasn't in there before. Because you always think about the battle of Armageddon, like this huge battle and these forces coming. But if we literally read, Right, bam. It wasn't this prolonged battle. I mean, like we've seen now in the Ukraine, and they talk about things going back and forth, or, you know, we've been to Civil War sites, and they talk about the, the people on both sides, or, you know, World War I, and Grace was doing something on, I think it was World War I, she was talking about the trenches, you know, they had, and no, man, no man's land where nobody would go between, and, you know, it wasn't, it was like, the battle started, the beast and the, the false prophet were thrown into the thing, and the rest were killed by the sword, and then the buzzards did the rest. And those are some happy buzzards. The Bible says, and the birds were filled with their flesh. I mean, again, that's the, that's the image that we're facing. One strike, bam, that's it. Next week we're going to look at the we'll look at the millennial reign of Christ um, and how that happens and what happens during that time, um, and so we're getting there. Um, so in a couple of weeks we're going to finish up and, and as I mentioned last week we're going to go into the doing the Beatitudes. Uh, Miss Kathy's putting together um, uh, our study books on that, and so we'll be looking at nine lessons on uh, the Beatitudes and going through that, looking at each one individually. All right? Well, let's close in a word of prayer. Remember Bentley tomorrow um, and uh, others that have got going things going on. And uh, I did hit record this time. All right? So you don't have to apologize to your sister for me or Regina. I know Regina would give me a hard time. She would. So... But let's pray.